Hey, uh, my name is Robert Gerst. Uh, I'm one of the elders here at First Baptist Church. Uh, I started coming to First Baptist roughly around 14 years ago with my wife, Karen. Uh, we've been married for about 27 years. Uh, thanks, yeah. <laughs> I think she would say maybe 25 of them have been great. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys guess which two aren't. Uh, but that being said, we have a son who's 22, getting ready to turn 23. Um, he's in the military um, and has been serving there for almost three and a half years. Um, so that's kind of our family. We came to Durango in 1999. So we've seen a few changes. My son was actually even born at the Old Mercy Hospital, which is now currently the library. So, um, so before we dive in to Psalm this morning, uh, Psalm 103, uh, I want to take a moment just to pray and calm our hearts before the Lord. So Father, uh, we come before you. Um, we're just grateful for your creation, Lord. Your word says that your creation declares your glory. And Father, I pray that we would see your glory, uh, not only in your creation, but that we would recognize that we're your creation, Lord, and that we would see you evident in the lives of those around us who call themselves Christ followers. Father, I pray for our military, for the women and men who serve in our armed forces, Lord. I pray that you would bring about protection for them, Lord, and that your period of peace and presence would be heavy upon them as they walk out the situations that they're called into, that they protect our freedom and how they lift up others. Lord, I thank you for your word and that your word is true and that it transforms. God, I ask that this morning that your word would be all that comes from my mouth and that everything else that's chaff would just blow away in the wind. I thank you and I praise you for who you are and what you continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I kind of want to start off with a little bit of interaction, and I hope you guys are awake, because I really need some interaction on this part, all right? So I'm going to start a piece of a song, and then I want you to give me the next verse. Right, so we'll start off easy, okay? <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Excellent, all right? So, old MacDonald had a farm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, nailed it. Excellent. So... You know, those songs elicit memories in your mind, right? Like, it, it, you're remembering a, a birthday, a, a place, a time, a moment, right? Maybe it's the first time you heard Old MacDonald, you know, being taught by your parents. Or maybe it was you singing it to your grandkids, you know? Or maybe it was a memory from elementary school where you heard those songs. And that's kind of what the songs are about, right? The Psalms are about remembering. They're about bringing us back into the presence of God, about remembering historical pieces and how they bring us to current times. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning in the Psalm of David. You know, David, uh, just to give you some background, I mean, we're going to cover this whole Psalm, right? So we're, this is all 30,000 feet as we look at this Psalm and as we look at David's life. So, because there's so much there. But David, he was from Bethlehem. He was a shepherd. Um, he was the youngest of seven brothers. Um, he was anointed by Samuel to be king long before he ever became king. Uh, he was a musician. He was a giant slayer. Um, he established Jerusalem as the capital. Uh, he was Israel's greatest king. Uh, he set up the tabernacle in Jerusalem. And there was worship that went on there 24-7. Um, he was also an adulterer right, with Bathsheba and a murderer. He killed her husband, Uriah. But even after all that, David, more importantly, was a man after God's own heart. So that's the guy from 30,000 feet who wrote this song. Okay? Just, just that general premise of who he is. So we want to look at Psalm 103, verse 1 and 2. And like Nate said, that's in page 502 in your Bible, that's in front of you. And so we're going to start with verse 1 and 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. So when you think about the word bless, where does your mind go? I mean, my mind goes to an action. You know, I want to bless you. I want to come serve you a meal. I want to help you work on your car. 
I want to financially support you. I, no, I, I want to do all of these things. I want to do these things. It's a tangible for me. It, it's this effort that I want to put forth. But David's not saying that there's an effort there, a tangible. It's an intangible because he's asking for his soul to bless the Lord. He's asking for his, his innermost being, his personhood, that his heart, that, that quiet, still voice that we all have. You know, we know that this skin doesn't define us. It's who we are on the interior. You know, like the quality of character is defined by who you are when no one else is around. You know, that internal component is what David's calling out to bless the Lord. And I believe that David is actually in kind of a dark place in his soul right now. Because he says that in verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And why would he say that he, you know, do not forget all of his benefits? If he hadn't forgotten. If he hadn't, like, wandered away within his soul. And he recognized that he was in a place that wasn't worshiping properly from his heart. So I think David had truly forgotten what it meant. You know, had forgot those benefits. You know, I, I, one other component that we need to think about in the word bless is how it's defined in this term. It's a place of worship. It isn't that action that I thought it was. It's a place of worship. It's to kneel down. It's to be, to be humble before your creator, before your Lord. That's that blessing that David's calling out, that, that piece of worship. So, what are the benefits of following God in your life? You know, let's see where David goes. So we look at verses 3 through 5. And we look, David's kind of looking at the character of God in this moment. It reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Verse 3, Who forgives all your iniquity. Iniquity is immorality wickedness, like grossly unfair behavior. So who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your disease, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. So I think David here is kind of remembering the character of God. That he's a God who forgives, a God who heals disease, a God who redeems, a God who crowns, who bestows upon you steadfast love and mercy, and a God who satisfies you with good. You know, when we hear a God who heals diseases, maybe we think about cancer, maybe we think about leukemia, maybe we think about a hip or an elbow or a knee or what. We, we think about that disease. But the greatest disease that God can heal is the sin that's within our hearts and within our soul. And see, those diseases, cancer and the busted up hip or the busted up knee, wouldn't be here if it weren't for sin. Because God created us perfect, right? And then in the Garden of Eden, we were perfect. And disease came about as a result of our sin. So in that moment, the greatest disease that we can be healed from is the disease of sin, that pride, that lust, that greed, those idols. And he redeems us. And, and this steadfastness, because David's going to use the word steadfast three times throughout this psalm. God's love is steadfast. It's resolute. It's unwavering. It's, it's there. It's constant. But what does it mean when he says that your youth may be renewed like the eagle's? So, I start squirreling out on eagles, trying to figure out why the reference in this one. What does it mean? You know, eagles are a raptor, so they're a bird of prey. And so, you know, they're, they're the ones who are swooping down. You've probably seen the National Geographic where it comes down out of the sky, boom, right into the ocean, comes up with a trout bigger than the one that Jimmy could ever catch. You know, I mean, you know. <laughs> You know, you'll see him swoop down and crash through the brush and maybe grab a rabbit or a squirrel or maybe it's a small fox, right? And so, so eagles, you know, they're these predatory birds that are amazing in their flight. But one of the things that happens is, is that their wings begin to deteriorate over time. 
because of the damage that they're seeing. And so eagles molt every single year. And so these damaged wings, these damaged feathers, begin to fall out naturally. You know, they don't pluck them, because if they do, they'll, they'll ruin the follicle that's there, and it'll, it'll cause blood loss, it'll cause pain, and that feather may never grow back if they were to pluck it out. And what's really interesting is the flight feathers, if, if an eagle loses one on the left side, simultaneously it loses the one on the right. And the reason for that is as a bird of prey, it would throw their flight off. Kind of like having bad tires on your car, right? You know, if the left front tire is bad, you're just veering to the left. You know, if the right front tire is bad, you're back to the right. You know, but the eagle sheds those feathers at the same time. They come out naturally. And over a course of about 150 days, the eagle's feathers are changed and they're all renewed. And so in that moment, the eagle has gone from a prop plane to a fighter jet again. You know, it's like the guy walking with the cane who then is running the sprints like he used to run in his youth. You know, and so David in this moment recognizes potentially that there is a renewing that can take place when the old falls away at God's hand and the new comes. So, I can only imagine or speculate where he's going to in his mind because this psalm, because of where, what he puts out there, this psalm really shows the historical evidence of where he's been. He's mature in his life in this moment. Don't know his exact age, but he's up there. Yeah. And so as he's up there, you know, and in his age, he's probably reflecting back on 1 Samuel 16 13. And it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, anointed David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Can you imagine that? What it must have felt like to have the Spirit of the Lord rush upon you? You know, that, I looked up that word in the Hebrew, and it's to cleave, it's to penetrate, it's to force entry. The Spirit of the Lord came into David and was with him from that day forward. And I think there's a very unique parallel for us as believers because we have the Holy Spirit within us. For those of us who call Jesus Lord and Savior, we know that, that the Holy Spirit indwells us. We hear it in John 14, 16 through 17, and Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So that same indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that the same indwelling that David has, as a believer, you have that with you eternally. You know, if you call in Jesus your Lord and Savior. So as we move on to verse 6 through 10, we begin to look at the works of God. It says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. So David is remembering these works of God. He's remembering how he works righteousness and justice for Israel and for himself with Saul. He makes known his ways. You know, David's thinking about Moses, the Ten Commandments, the Levitical law. God had actually given them a blueprint on how to enter into relationship with him. God was merciful in how he dealt with David when it came to Bathsheba. And he has this, he's slow to anger. You know, that's an actual quote from Exodus 34, 6. 
David's quoting scripture back to himself in this moment as he's trying to remember the benefits of the Lord. He's abounding in steadfast love. There's that word steadfast again, right? Again, he's remembering this unwavering and resolute love that God shows for him. And he does not always chide. And unfortunately, chide, you know, ADHD goes off. And I go, oh, chives, you know, the onions. We love cooking. You know, rrr, 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 squirrel, you know. And, and the word is actually chide. And chide means to scold or rebuke. And see, God will not always scold or rebuke us. I mean, he will, trust me, until we recognize our sin and repent. And that's immediately lifted from us. That scold and that rebuke. Because he wants us, our hearts to be transformed and turned back to him. So, God does not keep his anger forever. He doesn't hold a grudge. He does not deal with us according to our sins. See, if he had, we'd be gone. David knew he would be gone. God dealt with our sins through Jesus. Jesus took that wrath for us. Right? See, when Jesus came into the world, the Son of God, he came down from heaven. He recognized that we were sinful people, that we couldn't fulfill the law, that we couldn't fulfill these Ten Commandments, the things that were set before by Moses, we couldn't do. We could not do them perfectly. But Jesus came down and he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled those commandments. He fulfilled that law to the fullest on our behalf. And he became a perfect sacrifice for our sin. There were no longer goats and pigeons that were put to the altar. It was Christ being put to the cross to die for our sins. And in that death, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, as he died in those moments, he went down and defeated Satan, Satan, sin, and death. But the story doesn't end there. He was resurrected three days later. That's the conquering. And now he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. And so not only do we get forgiveness of sin for those of us who believe in Christ Jesus, but we also have a right standing with God now and forevermore. So there's an excitement that God hasn't dealt with us according to our sin. That he, he dealt with it through Jesus he doesn't repay us according to our iniquities. Iniquities are our immorality, our wickedness, our grossly unfair behavior. And we can recognize all this again through Scripture in John 3, 16 and 17. That it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we move into verse 11 and 12 now. Verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So as high as the heavens are above the earth, his, his steadfast love is for us. That, that resolute, that unwavering love he has for us. And so David's like looking at it, like looking to the heavens and not ever seeing an end, right? There's this boundless, there's this grandeur, this glory, this infinite, eternal God that loves David that much. And not only loves David that much, but loves us that much. And so I think he's sitting in a place of awe. Because, I mean, we can't even find the ends of the heavens. You know, with the Hubble telescope or the space station. We're not there. And we're not going to get there. It's God's love is boundless for those who fear him. Now, that this word fear, right, isn't that, that ooh, you know, this fear is a holy fear. It's a reverence. It, it's a understanding 
of the boundless nature of God, the greatness of this creator. And in that, there is a bowing down, there is a, an understanding that he is God, he is creator. He brought me into this world, he can take me out. <laughs> and so it, there's, there's a reference in those moments. And then David gives us this vertical illustration, or excuse me, horizontal illustration that he cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. How crazy is it that David, in this moment, understands the forgiveness of sin to that degree? David hadn't seen Jesus yet. David was walking in promises, in covenants, in commandments, and yet he knew that there was a forgiveness as far as the east is from the west. And that same forgiveness is extended to us that for those who believe in Christ Jesus. That when we repent to God, when we ask forgiveness of one another, he throws those sins as far as the east is from the west. And again, that begins to demonstrate that boundless nature of love. So David has created this, like this bubble. <coughs> A bubble that has no end. The, it, the balloon that doesn't have any rubber to it, right? It's just this, it's this massive, enormous component of who God is. And he's sitting in awe in this moment. So as we look now at verses 13 through 18, I think David's starting to look at this boundless, infinite, eternal God. And how does he even relate to man? David says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. So David remembers how God has cared for him with the compassion of a father throughout his life. You know, we, we remember how we talked about kind of how he had walked out certain components in his life, kind of getting that picture of who he is. And in all of those moments, in his immaturity to what he would consider his maturity now, he recognizes that this boundless God is also personal, is also relational, is loving and caring in such a way that he's, he, he again is overwhelmed by that steadfast love. It's interesting that that steadfast love is shown again for the fourth time now. And, it, and that steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. So again, what does everlasting to everlasting mean? It's from eternity past to eternity present. Just ponder that type of love for a moment. He loves you from eternity past to eternity present. And he's unwavering in that love. How glorious is that? How glorious is that? And he remembers, too, that this boundless God loves him despite that he's, he knows that he's dust. He knows that this finite body is here today, gone tomorrow. But that soul is eternal in that moment. I think he's actually looking back to Genesis 2-7, right? Quoting scripture to himself again. Because, you know, Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then the Lord formed man from dust, from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So David knows that God created man from dust. He created him. And yet this creator wanted to be in relationship with him. So again, that fear that David's talking about here is that, that deep respect, that honor due to God 
upon his infinite nature, upon, upon his creativity, upon the fact that he's eternal. And what's interesting is David talks about those, you know, the covenant and the commandments, right? Jesus fulfilled those perfectly. And in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus has a new covenant that satisfies the law and the commandments. It says in verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So we have a freedom in Christ, right? A freedom as a result of his works. And so in verses 19 through 22, David recognizes that everything God created blesses him. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O oh, you angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. I think one of the, the key components here is that David recognizes that the Lord has already established his kingdom and his kingdom rules over all. I mean, David is a king, right? He is a king, and yet he realizes that God's kingdom is established and is greater than his kingdom. And that, that kingdom has been established from eternity past to eternity present. And eternity beyond. So, I mean, it, 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 David is in this moment of awe. Like, it, all of a sudden, his soul is being transformed as he begins to recognize these things. That this, that this kingdom has already been made. And that his, in God's kingship, he has authority over everything. His kingdom rules over all. What part of all don't we understand? And then David's heart was stirred to call out to the angels. And so he, he says, Bless the Lord, O you angels, you mighty ones who do your word, obeying the voice of his word. So he's calling out to those angels above. And he, he also says, Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers who do his will. You know, that host is his army, his, his heavenly entourage, or the priests, or the ministers in these moments. So he's calling out to these individual things, right? He's kind of going through the list in his mind. He's saying, you know what? The angels are going to bless him. The hosts are going to bless him. And, and then, wait, hold on just a second. Just bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Because David recognizes probably that he could go on with a list of bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless... No, because ultimately, everything that God created blesses him. It's there to bring worship and honor and glory to him. And in this moment, all of a sudden, David's heart goes from, I've forgotten his benefits to now I've remembered them. And so bless the Lord, oh my soul. I've remembered who the God of my salvation is. My heart's been transformed. My soul's been transformed in this moment. And I want to bless him. So as we look back over the psalm, right, we see that David starts with this acknowledgement that his soul had forgotten the benefits of God. And so rather than just sulking in that, right, he remembers that our God is a God who forgives, who heals, who redeems, who crowns you with love and mercy, who satisfies you, who renews you like the wings of the eagles, who, who works righteousness and justice. He makes his no, ways known. 
He's merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. You know, he goes on and on and on, and he begins to, he works his way all the way through this, looking at those components, telling himself all of these benefits of God to come to this place of worship. And so I guess that's my question to you this morning. Now, what are you preaching to yourself? To quote Hee Haw, which <laughs> only, only a select generation will get. Are, are, are you preaching doom, despair, and agony on me? Oh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Doom, despair, and agony on me. Is that what you're preaching to yourself in this moment? Or are you going back and remembering his benefits? What are those specific benefits of being a Christ follower? Can you remember in your life, your salvation, the moments where you've seen his hand at work? Because David didn't go to his works. He went to God's works. And so are you looking at your own works in these moments? Or are you looking at God's works in your life? And so remember those benefits that he's bestowed upon you. And then lastly, what scriptures truly stir your soul? You know, for, for David, it was in this moment it was Exodus, you know, 34, 6, and, and Genesis 2, 7. You know, what are those scriptures that truly stir your soul to worship, to bless the Creator, to bless your Savior? in these moments. You know, when you think about those components, it should drive you to, to remember what Jesus has done for you. You know, his death, his resurrection, what he's brought about for us as Christ followers, the forgiveness of sin, the sin that's been cast as far as the east is from the west, that we might be in that eternal steadfast love that is as high as the heavens are above the earth.